Dr. James Schwartz from Wichita State University. Please give Dr. Schwartz a warm welcome. Uh, thank you. And I think, uh, what, Les invited me here because he thought you all needed ethics training? Is that the uh, thought? Uh, so um, my background is in philosophy, and I think a lot about uh, space policy issues and regulation and law. Uh, so I tend to focus on questions, what justifies space exploration? Uh, what sort of regulations do we want to have that guide us as we think about things like uh, utilizing near-Earth asteroids and other resources? Uh, today, I guess I'm going to be talking about planetary protection and as it pertains ultimately to interstellar travel. Uh, but first, I've got a book plug. Uh, so this is something we just sent off to the publisher a few days ago. I'm in an edited volume on ethics and space exploration. We've got a wide range of contributors. Jacques Carnot from Kness, Steve Baxter, the author, Charles Cockell, astrobiologist, Franz von der Dunk, uh, space lawyer, Mark Lupicella, who some of you might know from uh, Goddard. All right, so a lot of people and interesting stuff. So if you are at all intrigued by the kinds of things I have to say, in this talk, something you might want to check out when it comes out in, I don't know, two, three months, as it were. Uh, but anyway, so thought here is planetary protection. And for those of you that don't know what these policies are, these are policies that are put in place to minimize the contamination of sites of interest in the search for life in the solar system. So it would be really unfortunate if you go to Europa, drill down into the ice, discover microbial life, only to later realize those were microbes you brought with you. Uh, so there are varying degrees of uh, protection policy, sorry, varying protection policies based on where you're sending your mission to, whether it's a flyby mission, a lander mission, a rover mission, those sorts of things. All right. And the conventional understanding behind these is that we need these policies to preserve the viability of scientific research. Right? You don't want to spend all this money on research only to later realize you've wasted it because you discovered life that you brought with you. Uh, but lately, there's been a lot of interest, and I say lately in the sense of the last, I don't know, 25 years, uh, in thinking about planetary protection as an ethical issue. And COSPAR, the Committee on Space Research, has been sponsoring a lot of this discussion. And there's been this wider need, or rather a wider recognition, that we need to talk about ethics when we're thinking about planetary protection. And the view that I think's taken hold of the community at large is something like protection is motivated when it involves some kind of direct consideration, direct moral care uh, for the microorganisms that you're potentially discovering on Mars, Europa, uh, etc. Um, but I want to argue that this way of conceiving of ethics as it pertains to planetary protection is too narrow, that there are other ethical considerations that we ought to bring into play. And once we recognize those additional ethical considerations, uh, this is going to be relevant for thinking about planetary protection for interstellar exploration and not just solar system exploration. And so what I want to do is not just contribute to a discussion about uh, interstellar travel, but also try to say something that's relevant to policy here and now. Uh, that's where most of my work tends to focus. So I'm not going too far out of my comfort zone, I guess is the claim here. Well, so what does COSPAR say about the motivation behind planetary protection? This is in the preamble to their policy that the conduct of scientific investigations of possible extraterrestrial life forms, precursors, and remnants must not be jeopardized. And you might think, there's no ethics here. This is just a statement about protecting scientific interests. And yet we get reactions from folks like, I don't know, Carl Sagan, who says this about Mars exploration. If there's life on Mars, I believe we should do nothing with Mars. Mars then belongs to the Martians, even if the Martians are only microbes. The existence of an independent biology on a nearby planet is a treasure beyond assessing. And the preservation of that life form must, I think, supersede any other possible use of Mars. This is from uh, the Cosmos book. Uh, this sounds like an ethical claim to me. The idea that if there's life on Mars, that's worthy of protection for its own sake. That life is valuable whether or not we think there's any use we could put to it. And that would be a reason to protect uh, the environments on Mars. And there are sort of, I don't know, more modern versions of this view out there. Uh, Charles Cockell uh, has sort of been a main advocate of a position that we ought to treat microbes with some kind of moral consideration. And he asked this question uh, more recently. Uh, would we have any respect for these organisms, these extraterrestrial microbes? That is, any sense that we should not arbitrarily destroy them? It seems certain that we would. We recognize them as having a telos or a purpose. 
It is their direction of development, their responses to their environment, and they're exhibiting the properties of having a good of their own that we respect. And here he's drawing on a lot of work in environmental ethics about um, alternative views of moral considerability. When is something the kind of entity that we need to take into consideration when we deliberate about what the right thing to do is? All right, so he's drawing on positions that have taken hold in environmental ethics and applying it to uh, the case of extraterrestrial microbes. Right, maybe we don't buy into this, but this is a view that's gained some attention, at least in the astrobiology community. Uh, but again, what's the upshot here is that the view has taken hold that the only way that planetary protection could be considered ethical is if it's motivated by some kind of concern for extraterrestrial life, any that we might discover. And I think what we get here is a life bias in thinking about planetary protection. Maybe the life bias is the cause of these moves, Maybe these moves are the cause of the life bias. I don't want to sort of get into uh, the ordering there. But there's something like this in thinking about planetary protection. That if you have a world that's life-bearing, or at least potentially so, or a satellite or other celestial body, then that's worthy of protection. We ought to protect it for the sake of that life. On the other hand, if you have a lifeless body, no protection measures need to be considered at all. And I think this is a sort of dominant filter in thinking about planetary protection. That was the old title, Conceptual Filters, as it were. But I, I like the new title a little better. It's, it's punchier, right? Um, and I think this bias is not properly motivated. Right? We don't have a good enough philosophical or ethical justification for it. Because I think there are other duties that we need to be mindful of when we think about solar system exploration. And something that I've pushed for in my work is that we have a duty to engage in scientific research. We have a duty to learn about the solar system and the wider universe. And so activities that could compromise that duty are also things that we ought to consider invoking protection measures for. So it's not just the sites that are of interest to astrobiologists that we should worry about. We need to think about what's of interest to space scientists more generally. And I think if we have a greater sensitivity for the diverse array of scientific concerns in play in solar system exploration, that's going to make us more sensitive to a diverse amount, diverse, diverse, amount, uh, diverse reasons uh, for protection. And uh, one of my colleagues, Tony Milligan, I think expresses a nice sentiment that could maybe help get us into this mindset. Because Think about how often we conceive of Mars as, say, a potentially dead or lifeless world. The moon is dead, cold, lifeless. There's no oxygen there. All right, well, maybe instead of thinking about what these things aren't, it might be helpful to think about what these places are. And as uh, Tony says, it's a familiar human trait, but also a failing to encounter what is in terms of what it is not. It does not seem unfair to suggest that it is this sense of lack this sense of what isn't there, which shapes and to some extent distorts perceptions and feeds a dismissal of calls for planetary protection. And yet what is there is also remarkable in its own right. So the thought is we shouldn't be disappointed when we find out that some other planet fails to contain life. That's not as though it failed some test that Earth happened to pass. There still might be something of legitimate interest to the planet as it is. And so I think instead of conceiving of Mars as, say, a dead world, uh, maybe the words of uh, geologist Sean McMahon are going to be a little more helpful in thinking about what's important there. And I think this is nice. Uh, this is from his paper uh, that's going to come out in my volume. Uh, but anyway, so the sky is electric blue in the glow of the setting sun. Sometimes the blue returns before sunrise in high feathery wisps on the brightening sky, noctilucent clouds in the upper atmosphere. The little moon Phobos rises and sets twice daily, passing in front of its smaller, slower twin Deimos. In the warmer seasons, low latitude hillsides and crater flanks are painted in fine, dark, parallel strokes by trickles of salt water. On the floors of craters, black and red, sand and dust pile into ripples and dunes, the largest in the solar system. Dust devils are ubiquitous, scrawling dark curlicues on the desert floor, like the tracks in a cloud chamber. Now what's a more interesting place to go and study? A cold, dead, lifeless world, or this? I mean, how we describe these environments influences how we think about whether they're worth protecting. And if our only focus is on whether it's dead or alive, that really distorts things and it sort of shuts off 
a whole bunch of a whole bunch of interest in science. Okay, so broaching now the topic of moving on to interstellar travel, right? And interstellar protection. Interestingly enough, this has come up in uh, protection policies. So this is a, a part of a letter that was sent to the NASA planetary protection officer uh, about the end of the mission for Voyager and its planetary protection concerns. And so it says, okay, this document will re uh, record the project compliance for Voyager 2 at Neptune and the final disposition of the spacecraft relative to planetary protection. And both the previous and recently adopted NASA protection policies place requirements only on spacecraft which may encounter celestial objects in the solar system. Both Voyager 1 and 2 will encounter nothing further in the solar system because they will escape it. Thus, there are no requirements on the Voyager interstellar mission. All right, so protection policies only cover the solar system, so if something's going out of it, no protection concerns. And later on in the letter, it talks about, well, in about 40,000 years, we're going to get to some other system. Uh, so, you know, maybe by then we'll figure things out. Um, so I want to say that, look, when we're thinking ethically, whether we're talking about interstellar exploration or solar system exploration, when we think about protection, right, the strength of our various duties needs to be considered. And I think this duty to acquire knowledge about the universe is something that's always going to weigh heavily on us. Now, what's one of the things we always talk about when we talk about justifying interstellar travel? It's this long-term duty to ensure the survival of our species. But if we're going to think more contemporarily about what can we do right now to enable interstellar travel, what are the most important activities to think about in the short term, right? I'm going to say, look, there's no rush to colonize interstellar space. Right? This duty we have to continue our species is something that exerts its force over the very long term. And if what you're concerned about is surviving the next 100, 200, 300 years, guess what? There's going to be stuff that's going to kill us off that interstellar travel just won't help. Right? Asteroids back into the planet, right? global climate change. If we don't solve these problems, we're not going to get to the point where we have the technology to go to interstellar space. So if you want to solve these local problems, well, they need local solutions. So no rush to colonize. Right? Does that mean there's no rush to any kind of interstellar activity whatsoever? Certainly not. Right? It just means that we have a long-term duty here, and that's going to mean it's compatible with preserving other solar systems for scientific study for an extended period of time. And I think that, look, if you've got a pristine, unexplored system, that, like Sagan says about another biosphere, is a treasure beyond assessing. And that's not something we should disrupt or contaminate by over-hasty settlement. So I think, ethically speaking, we do have a motivation for protection policies for interstellar travel. It's the protection of scientific research of these other systems. And I think that's ethical whether or not we expect to find extraterrestrial life. So one thing I think we should not take with us as we explore is the life bias that we get in present thinking about planetary protection policies, that there are legitimate scientific interests, whether we're looking at planets that have life, systems that have life, or those that don't. Uh, now, what are these policies actually going to look like? So it's one thing to maybe motivate the idea that we should think about protection for interstellar travel, but it's another thing to actually make sense of what these policies could potentially involve. And Here's going to be a bit more speculation because until we're actually ready to send out a mission, we don't know what our capabilities are, so it's hard to know what risks are going to be associated with those. But it seems sensible to me that protection is going to be most needed in the early phases of interstellar exploration. That is, when we know least about the systems that we're exploring. And so I think what we want to strive, um, I'm sorry, what we want to strive for early on are missions that have the lowest risk of contamination or disruption of sites of potential scientific interest. Right? If we don't know what's there, we don't know what kind of things we might destroy if we're not careful. And so what does this mean? I think it means initially we need to focus on robotic exploration. And I think if you're thinking about sending humans anyway later on, you probably don't want to send them into a situation they know nothing about. So you're probably going to be on board with robotic exploration as an, uh, sorry, as an initial phase anyway. So what are some questions we might grapple with thinking about robotic missions as far as planetary protection is concerned? Well, how do we make sure the spacecraft is sterile on the long voyage? Right. 
cosmic radiation might solve that one for us. Right? But have to think about decontamination of spacecrafts on these missions. How do we know the hardware and software are going to hold up on the mission? So it's one thing to send a vehicle out to another solar system, but we need to make sure it works when it gets there and it sends back good data. Because if we don't get those things, then we're not learning anything about the target system and we're not preparing ourselves for any future missions to that system. Is the software going to be good enough to mimic the activities of a scientific community? So it's one thing to have a few instruments on board that can snap a few pictures as it goes on a long, fast flyby. But at the same time, you'd like to have some sort of intelligence there that can spot, hey, that's interesting. Let's pause here and look a little closer. Right? If we can't have that kind of investigation, then we're not really getting a very effective uh, knowledge of that system. Right? So ideally, we'd have some intelligent software in control of this probe that can mimic the way scientists look and think about systems. And so I don't think that we should really even think about robotic exploration too seriously unless we can have guarantees with these issues. But until we can shore this stuff up, any robotic mission is probably not going to be that reliable or send us very good information. And so things that I think are clearly undesirable in this situation, that is for initial exploration here, not necessarily in the very long term, but for initial missions, I think von Neumann probes, self-replicating machines, terrible idea that uh, sort of massive in situ resource use, we don't know what we'd be destroying by sending out self-replicating machines. Crewed missions that require in situ resource use. Again, if we're sending people that are forced <coughs> to use resources from the system without knowing what's there in advance, we don't know what we might end up destroying, what, uh, what of interest to science might be destroyed here. And similarly, life seeding missions, I think, initially are not good ideas because, again, they're going to populate a planet, ideally, with life forms. Now, again, was that planet something we would have liked to study before that seeding took place? Now we have no way of knowing. Right? And any other mission that's going to have a similar risk of contamination or excessive disruption, the things that are of potential scientific interest. So I want to leave you with this thought here then, uh, from Rolston in a paper about 30 years ago about protection in the solar system. And he says that humans are now in a poor position to say what the formed integrities elsewhere in the solar system are speculating over what places, planets, moons should be designated as nature preserves would be more foolish than for Columbus to have worried over what areas of the New World should be set aside as national parks and wildernesses. All the same, in retrospect, our forefathers would have left us a better New World had they been concerned sooner about preserving what they found there. And I think that's a nice thought for us to carry forward. We're not going to know what these policies look like, but it's still a good idea to make sure we're having an active discussion about what protection should look like for interstellar missions. Thank you. Whoever gets the microphone first. Okay, uh, two comments. <clears throat> first question, what you really talking about planetary protection is something that goes back to Konstantin Vilokovsky. And it was echoed, of course, by Gerard K. O'Neill and the other people involved in his space habitat study in the 1970s. Essentially, uh, people who go to the stars are not going to be terrestrials. They're going to be people used to using the resources of asteroids or comets, which are lifeless, and they're going to be expecting to do the same thing when they get there. And we know that almost every solar system is going to have asteroids and comets that we presume are lifeless. The second point is, I notice with Carl Sagan, the date on Cosmos. It's a recent uh, re reprinting of it. OK, yeah. well, that yeah. should be mentioned because I thought maybe you had access to a very sophisticated Ouija board. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's the most recent edition. I think it's got like a forward by Neil Tyson or something. But uh, okay. uh, as far as that first question is concerned, um, so I, I guess the point I would motivate is not that we have to bar resource use eternally, as it were, but we, we just want to make sure there's a period of time where 
scientific minds can get together and decide, is there anything here we really need to investigate? And so I just sort of want that to be the first era of any exploratory phase is, you know, let's wait a decade or two, let's figure out if there's something here we want to study before we go and start uh, developing things. <coughs> Hi, I, I have a two-part question. The first, ethicists don't all agree with each other about things. There are schools of ethics, so I'd kind of like to know what school you tend to favor, for example, Kant or Dewey or Rawls or Peter Singer. That's part one. Part two is the problem with uh, essentially abstract announcements of ethical principles is that they don't actually look at trade-offs. For example, some of us feel there's a significant probability that there's subsurface life on Mars. The recent methane emissions detected there at least suggest that it could be possible um, because in fact we know that subterranean uh, life on Earth also emits a great deal of methane. But, so, but the point is exploring subsurface is extremely difficult. The cost by the way of a one drilling mission to Mars is about one and a half billion dollars and therefore there are trade-offs. But the most likely way to explore it would be to go into one or uh, more of the several hundred caves we already know exist on Mars. In fact, I wrote a whole novel about this published in 1999 called The Martian Race. So the second part of the question is, how does an ethical system confront these trade-offs? It's not a matter of abstract principles. It's got to be also some what? Right. Good, good, good. So, uh so then quickly, so I, I think what you find in discussions about space policy, there's a lot of convergence in what you say regardless of what theoretical position you take. So, so whether you're a consequentialist or a deontologicalist with your Kantian or a, a Benthamite, the things you're gonna say about what to do are probably gonna be remarkably similar. You're just, your reasons behind it are going to differ. So I would maybe say that there's more agreement in, in ethics than you might think about low level things. Um, and then as far as, now I'm trying to remember what the other part of the question is. Uh, oh, so, so the reply, to, yeah, the, the reply to the second part is that um, it's a consideration I, I'm pushing for us to keep in mind, and not necessarily an overriding one. And so the idea is let's not forget about this. Let's not proceed as though there's never any concern at all for protection. So I might be stating the case more strongly than I need, just to get it in your head and think about it. As it were. Um, recently, it's been mainly the government that's been, or governments that have been responsible for space missions and that kind of thing, but as the rise of commercial interests uh, going into space, particularly long term as they develop the, um, their infrastructure up there, how do you keep something like, say, a future East India company from, who's, you know, poured billions or trillions of dollars into getting to another planetary system from getting there and being like, well, now we can't do anything in the system because we've discovered life. Yeah, so enforcement's a tricky question. I mean, how can you enforce really anything in the Outer Space Treaty when you're just talking about activities in orbit? I think we're just about out of time. Is that a concern? Okay. Um, so that's another discussion. What might you say about enforcement? Um, however, but again, what, what, what I would push for is the same in that situation that that I want is a system that at least gives an opportunity for the scientific community to say, no, this is something we want to study. And so if you think about future regulations, what might those look like? You might have it as part of the licensing regime that you've got to bring scientists with you wherever you're going so they can sort of hit the pause button if something comes up during the exploitation phase. Now, how practical is that? Is that something that's realizable? Well. Something similar like that is happening with the ISA's deep sea mining, or at least more of a social justice issue. So it's not that far removed from the kinds of policy discussions that are taking place about things like uh, mining of the deep sea bed. Okay. Thank you very much.